I've written The New Poverty 75 years after Beveridge published his groundbreaking report to look at what's happened in the five key areas that he dealt with, want, disease, squalor, idleness and ignorance, and try to understand why we seem to be going backwards, why the improvements and the benefits that we all could have shared had his dreams been carried through, why we're seeing people getting poorer, why we're seeing people's health deteriorating, housing falling apart, education coming to pieces, and the, the, the shattering of the jobs market so that we can only see that the future is going to be bleaker than the past. So William Beveridge was a sort of economist come civil servant in a quite uh, nebulous capacity who during the Second World War was given this, this job that he didn't really want in all honesty, um, which was to understand social insurance, understand health insurance, unemployment insurance in the UK. Uh, and this was as a result of the horror of the 1930s, really. And he worked with a lot of people, he did a lot of research, and he really exceeded his brief with this, this enormous report which set out to really solve all the problems of the country and to bring the, those in need into the mainstream to make sure that we all had an equal chance, all had an equal opportunity, that no one need to suffer ill health, no one need to suffer unemployment, and no one need to be uneducated in, this, in, the, in the great new future that, um, that we saw at the end of the Second World War. He talked about it being a revolutionary time and how revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. Although I think it's important to point out that he was no revolutionary. I mean, a lot of what he was doing was attempting to make Britain rich because he felt that if you took the burden of certain things from the individual or the company and put them onto the government, it would be easier for individuals and companies to be more entrepreneurial, to uh, create wealth. And uh, so he wasn't a socialist. He was, he, was, he was looking out for the, he was an economist. The welfare state, as Beveridge envisaged it, was, was about ensuring that there was a free education for all, there was free health care for all, that if people were out of work uh, in between jobs or for any reason out of work, they would be looked after by the state, that, that people would be involved in some way in paying into that, it wasn't a situation where it would simply be... Um, and that people would have sufficient housing, and not just sufficient housing, but mixed housing. He, he saw this idea that we would all live together, that there would be these streets where uh, doctors, lawyers, bricklayers, cab drivers all live side by side in this uh, affordable, good quality housing. Because Beveridge was not, if you like, a dyed-in-the-wool socialist, it was easy for everyone to buy into what he was saying. The, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, both in their post-war governments, put certain aspects of what he proposed into effect. The Labour government, most notably in 48, a large part. But the Conservatives followed up by continuing and supporting those ideas. And those ideas start to fall apart with, I guess, the rise of neoliberalism. They start to fall apart in the 1980s, this idea that we are no longer connected, that we're not a society where we all benefit from each other doing well, that there are individuals and families and that there is a, a battle for survival, if you like. Uh, and gradually, all of the things that Beveridge put into place began to be chipped away, from secure employment to council housing to uh, investment in the health service uh, and, and to, to unemployment benefits. The, things started to really change then. The post-war era obviously saw an enormous number of improvements which were nothing to do with Beveridge. There was electricity, there were cars, I mean, the whole country is clearly in a far better place than it was in 1936, 1939, the year that he was responding to and that he was writing about. Having said that, the, the security and the uh, improvements that he looked to build into people's lives, the, the good housing, the good jobs, you know, the, the good at point of service, free healthcare and the great education. We're seeing those things start to decay and start to fall apart. Well, we've seen that happen really over the last 20, 30 years. We've seen tiny incremental cuts, changes, modifications, which means that we can no longer say that the future is rosy for the next generation or that we are going to be better off than the generation who benefited from Beveridge's improvements. So, you know, we are going backwards. Beveridge identified what he called the five giants or the five evils as being the, the, the big problems that the country was having to wrestle with. And he used quite grandiose language. He called these want, disease, squalor, idleness, and ignorance. And what he was really talking about was poverty, uh, free health care, poor housing, unemployment, and education. When Beveridge talked about want, he meant poverty. And he looked at how much money people needed to survive. His version, his measurement of poverty was about what was the minimum 
income, what were the minimum things that people needed to live a full and productive life. And he, he meant social engagement in this as well. He was coming from a time in the 30s where there was literally no cover for some people, where you had to pay into a social insurance scheme to get some kind of unemployment benefit or where unions would look after you. So there were some people who, if they were unemployed for long periods of time, relied on charity at best. He did, thought that was a, a poor idea and made it a right. It made it something that, the, the, that we all had to worry about, was how those of us who didn't have a job were going to make it through. Um, to some degree, the ideas began to sip with, with this idea that, that there is re almost a return to the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. You began to find a narrative which says that there are some people that, that, that benefit fraud, benefit scroungers, benefit tourists, benefit um, uh, cons and scams, started to become really part of the national conversation. We started to see all oh, these families of 10 kids who are but sponging off the state. As an interesting aside, most of the families that the newspapers cover are, are a handful of families. At best, there's 180 households like that, and some of them appear again and again and again. BuzzFeed did an analysis of those stories, and they found that one woman called Maria, with nine kids who lives on benefits, has appeared in every single tabloid paper again. So the, those ideas are largely fictional, but they've become very powerful. While this has been happening, and whilst the, the, the welfare state has been undermined in that respect, what we've seen is that jobs, secure, stable employment, which has always been, since beverage, all the way through, even now politicians pay lip service to this, the way out of poverty, is no longer the solution. We're seeing for the first time two-thirds of people who are in poverty are people with jobs. So people have full employment. The country has full employment in a way that probably we haven't had since the 1970s, and yet people are getting worse off. And you're seeing poorer families and middle-income families cycling in and out of this terrible lack of basic essentials, basic amenities, parents going without food so their kids can eat, parents not letting you know, kids go on school trips, parents um, having to give over all their money for the, for, just to, to make it through, borrow money to make it through. So uh, poverty has changed. Poverty has changed from those people who have nothing, have no jobs, to those people who ought to have something and now are struggling to get by. Beveridge saw disease not just as a moral problem, but as an economic problem. He saw that the lost hours to disease were, were dangerous to the British economy. And so he wanted to make sure that people got free health care as quickly as possible across the board. I mean, he, he thought that dental care should be free. He thought every single possible form of care should be entirely free. Very, very quickly after that was put into play in the 1940s, that began to be chipped away at. We started to find prescription charges, dental uh, the care was no longer free. We, little bits of that were chipped away. We still think that we have a good NHS with a, with, with a good free point of care for anyone in the country who wants it. I mean, in a certain way, that's true. The, you know, the, the people who work in the NHS are hardworking, brilliant people. It's amongst the finest you know, results of any healthcare system in the world. What, what is the case, though, is that there are fewer GPs in poorer areas, that people who are unable to pay, for instance, £20 for missing a dental appointment, find that they can no longer afford dental care, so they start doing their own DIY dentistry. Um, if, if you find that the life expectancy of people in poorer areas is diminishing and decreasing, the, that simply not being well off is dangerous to your health in a vast variety of ways. You're seeing, you know, in the UK today, you're seeing two to three people starving to death every week. And this is unimaginable. I mean, Beveridge ought to have removed the possibility that people would starve to death in one of the world's largest economies. Beveridge was responding to the slum conditions of the 1930s. These, we understand them for myth. You know, the outside toilet, two up, two down, really shoddily built Victorian housing that was bulldozed really at the end of the Second World War. He, he, he set out what he thought it should be and really we responded. I mean, it was sort of underway, but um, the idea of really good quality communities that were, would be built to serve the whole country. To some degree, controversially, uh, there were some architectural decisions made which may not have helped that. Even so, there was, to, there was social engineering involved. So what you found was that slum communities would be moved into new tower blocks or into new estates like Speak outside Liverpool. But instead of moving the community together, people were almost randomly flung around. 
So you would find that you might be miles away from your previous next door neighbor and therefore you'd be surrounded by strangers. And so grad really from the beginning, that the, the cohesion, the community cohesion that, that um, Beveridge saw as being important was, was fractured and fragmented. But the housing stock by and large, the low rise housing was, was far better than the slum conditions. Um, and then we began to sell off council houses. In the 1980s, the right to buy stopped councils building social housing and allowed people to buy their houses, removing it from stock. So we had fewer social houses, with fewer council houses, fewer social housing, that the areas where people did sell off their houses, quite often the entrepreneurial people would sell off their houses. It would then often go to private landlords who would then rent it out. And you would find that the, that the very fact of removing these houses from an area then gradually made the area tougher and tougher and harder to live in and made it. So, so it furthered the poor quality of, of the area. It brought the whole area down. It was the largest single transfer of capital to the working class in history. So we, we shouldn't, be naive about the, the value of it. But the, the key thing was that there was no more housing built. And that's where we are now. We have insufficient housing for the country. The housing we've got is in a terrible state and no councils are allowed to replace the houses they've lost. When Beveridge proposed unemployment benefit, he was in a time where people had jobs for most of their lives with brief periods of unemployment in between. And he saw that the benefit would cover that gap, the gap until you found work. We've switched that around now. The, the common state is for people to be in precarious short-term jobs, have long periods of unemployment with brief periods of work in between. Essentially, unemployment or struggling to find jobs has become the norm as opposed to being in jobs. We've seen the rise of zero hours contracts, agency work, just generally precarious jobs, short-term contracts. It's really hard to find jobs in the way that the unemployment benefit was designed for. And so the benefit system is not fit for purpose any longer. It's based on, a, on an economy and a society that no longer exists. Unfortunately, some of the proposals to deal with this, whilst conceptually and philosophically sound, there are many interesting things about universal credit, this idea that people should have a certain minimum income which should be there whether they were working or not, so which made it very easy for people to go in and out of work, to deal with short-term contracts, deal with precarious work. But it's been a, there's been so many moral and uh, uh, complex additions to the way that's, that's been administered. There's so many problems about the way it's been administered, which have been willfully added based on the way that we think about people who own benefits, that it's become an almost deadly form of benefit. It's become worse than an out-of-date, outmoded benefit system, which is not fit for purpose. So we've managed to make it worse. And alongside this, we've seen the, the just destruction of a viable employment market. So you've seen the agency uh, regulations of 1994 removing any kind of license to be a, re a responsible operator of employment agencies uh, at the same time as large companies handed all of their HR functions out to a, uh, employment agencies, which would have one branch in uh, Poland and one branch in London and would willfully bus employees in to work at meat factories or, or warehouses, um, creating the kinds of tensions that we've seen between communities over the last five years, the, the kind of tensions that led to people probably voting Brexit. So the, the work has been destroyed and the benefit system is being destroyed. And we're in a situation where it's hard to see what's good. Beveridge's final giant was ignorance. Uh, there was a basic education available to everyone in the country uh, when he was writing, but what he thought was that that was essentially scraping by. That was at best preparing people for factories or to go and work in the uh, Indian Empire. Um, what he set about building was a comprehensive education for people, for everyone in the country to be brought up to a very high standard comparatively of education and to be offered the chance to go for free to university. And the reason he thought saw this as important was not because he felt it would further individual careers, but that he felt that an educated, engaged workforce could only be of benefit to a country in the, in the kind of rapidly technologically changing world that was beginning to emerge at the end of the Second World War. And what we've seen now is, particularly with the introduction of uh, student loans, but also with the gradual defunding of large parts of that post-school uh, edu post-16 education is that that sort of education has become an individual consumer choice. It's no longer about what, how the country can share a, a, a bright new future. It's about how can you choose what you want to do in order to get a slide. Um, and don't, for heaven's sake, don't try to work in the creative arts or don't try to work in the, in the community. 
Ironically, of course, in the near future, uh, computers will be able to drive cars, write computer programs, engineer things far better than we can. And the only hope we've got is the creative industries and the creative arts, but that's not acceptable at the moment. Um, we also, with uh, Beveridge, is, is he saw that the, the school education is being essential, and we are defunding that. Recently, uh, all the head, a significant percentage of the uh, nation's head teachers wrote to parents explaining how dire the situation was and begging them to write to their MPs. We're in a situation where the heads of schools are writing to parents saying, please, to save your children's education, you need to become politically involved. This is a desperate time. And the final point about ignorance is that Beveridge felt that it was important that we all knew about each other. Part of the education is about bringing working class grammar school kids up into the culture, which, you know, Gave us the Beatles, gave us Melvin Bragg, bless his heart. All those, all those great 60s, 70s working class writers, thinkers, filmmakers, musicians were a result of that education system. And now, not only are we undermining that education system, but we're gradually losing what we know about other parts of the country as a result. We're not learning what the experience was of growing up in Merthyr Tidwell. We don't understand what it is to be from Hartlepool because the, the, the successful survivors of education are a very small, wealthy group of people who no longer care what everyone else is up to.